Hi, Phyllis here. We're going to be fixing some um, chuck rose this morning, and I wanted you to look at this label. I got two chuck rose. It was buy one, get one free at Piggly Wiggly, and I got them for. This one was six sixty seven. Now I got two, so that made each one about three dollars and thirty three cents. And it's let's see, two point two three pounds. So I'm going to show you how I fix the chuck roast. All right. Before I get started, I'm going to put on my latex gloves. Now you can get a pack of about eighty of these for about $7 in Walmart. And it just makes cooking meat and especially chicken much easier because after I get through doing all of the work on the meat, I can just put them in the wrapper here and throw them away. All right, let's get started. The first thing I'm gonna do with this chuck roast is to put tenderizer on it. Now, the uh, tenderizer is made, uh, it's probably an enzyme from papaya. So it says three-fourths of a teaspoon per pound. So it looks like a lot, but it's just what they call for. Then you're going to pierce the meat every half inch. Now, this is still frozen a little bit. So I'm going to just pierce it really good. There we go. And it says to um, go ahead and cook it right away as soon as you put it, put the uh, tenderizer on it. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over and put it on the next side. Now we will probably get three meals out of this chuck roast. And we'll eat some today and probably some tomorrow. And then what's left, I will make uh, vegetable soup, vegetable beef soup from it. Put a little more in here. And so you can buy cheaper cuts of meat if you put tenderizer on them. Now I've turned my burner on, and now I'm going to put some flour to coat it. And again, this is going to be all-purpose flour. Okay, just coat it really, really good. You know, put some in there. All right. Now we've got it good and coated. So I'm going to go ahead and put it in the skillet and I'm going to fix my vegetables. Now I won't be touching the meat anymore, so I'm going to take my gloves off just like nurses do in the hospital, inside out, put my fork in the sink and even my spoon. They're going to go to the garbage can. Okay, now see, my hands are all clean. I don't have to worry about germs or anything. Now I'm going to prepare the vegetables. And again, I'm going to put my peelings in this little um, earthbound salad container. And then I'm going to uh, transfer the peelings to the outside bucket that we use. And then my husband will end up taking it to the compost bin. Now I'm going to get a little uh, measuring cup or a, bit, a four cup measuring cup, put a little water and salt in it for the potatoes. So there I've got a little measuring cup and I'm going to put salt in it because I don't want my potatoes to turn dark and I've already washed them. And I'm going to leave a little bit of the peeling on simply because my husband likes peeling on and I don't, so we compromise. 
Okay, we're going to peel the rest of these. I just, I just simply go around it. Now these potatoes, these are were new potatoes when I bought them several months ago, and I bought them at the uh, farmer's market from a distributor, and I bought a 50-pound bag, and they were really beautiful when I first bought them. We're getting down to the bottom of the uh, bag now, and I stored them in the garage while it, while it was still cool. But once it started getting warm, I had to bring them in the kitchen, and I put them kind of under my stove area, and I keep them dark. Okay, so this is going to coat the potatoes with a little bit of that salty water. Okay. Now, the carrots, I also bought at the farmer's market. Now, I bought these in January. And I bought a 50-pound bag. Now, this is a half carrot. Let's see how big around that is. These were really big carrots. I had never used large carrots before, but I found them to be quite delicious, so I will be doing that again. But again, I bought them in January, and this is the 1st of August, so, and I've got plenty left. So my guess is a 50-pound bag, I don't know, will probably last us, I'm going to guess, and say 10 months. And of course, I got them at the same price the grocery stores have to pay, so it was really a good deal. Now they're still frozen, but remember they're fully cooked. So I'm just going to cut them in chunks. And I will position them in the pan with the meat after the meat browns. Now they will cook, of course, more, but they'll just simply get sweeter. Okay, they're my carrots. So I've got them potatoes, carrots, and now I'm going to do an onion. Now, the onions I bought at the farmer's market, they were Vidalia, or they were, I guess, a copy of Vidalia. I think they were from, I don't know, Brazil, Argentina, somewhere. And uh, we really used them all right away because they were really good and really sweet, and I used to bake them. I'm going to reach over here and turn my meat that's browning down just a little bit. Okay, so I'm just going to peel the onion, and I want the onion to stay in sections of, in, in really four sections. So I'm just going to peel that. Okay, now see this bottom where all of the little parts of the onion come together? I'm going to leave that on there because that's what's going to hold the four pieces together. Cut that top off. Okay, I'm going to just half it. See that little section? That's going to be, that'll be what will keep it all together because I don't want to have it spread all over my pan. Again, see there's a little section. Okay, so here are my potatoes, my onions, and my carrots. Now we're going to tend to the meat. I'm going to rinse my hands off real quick and I'll be right back. Back and we're going to move the camera over just a little bit so you can see how the meat is browning. All right, look. I don't want to get any grease on my lens, so there we go. That'll do it right there. And I've got my burner on medium high for right now. I might have to turn it down one more time. 
right. I'm going to cut this off until I'm ready to turn it over on the other side. Alrighty, we're back. And as you can see, the meat is already brown. Now you'll want to brown it on all sides or all surfaces that you can brown it on. I have put about two tablespoons of canola oil in this skillet. And again, this is uh, one of those, I think it's Gordon Ramsay cookware pieces. And it works very, very well in the oven because it doesn't have any plastic handles. And even the lid, which I'm going to put on in a few minutes, this can go in the oven and you've got something that can vent it so it doesn't boil over in your oven. All right, now we're ready to put the vegetables in. And the burner, now I'm going to have still on about medium, and I'm going to start putting the vegetables in. Now remember the potatoes have been soaking in a little salt water. And my carrots. Now see, my carrots are still somewhat frozen, but that's okay. Just going to dump those in. Now, I'm going to use about a cup and a half of water. I'm going to put a couple of tablespoons of teriyaki sauce in it. And I'm going to simply pour it over all these vegetables and the meat. Now, I'm gonna, I, 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 I did not put any salt in because the tenderizer has salt and the teriyaki has salt, so you don't need any additional salt. Now, I'm going to put the lid on this and I'm going to turn it up on high. And as soon as it starts boiling, I'm going to put it in the oven and I'll probably bake it in the oven, I don't know, maybe about three hours. It's about 11 o'clock now and we usually eat about 1, 1 1.30, so I'll check it then to see if it's done. So, okay, it's already just about ready to boil. And just as soon as it does that, we're going to put it in the oven. And again, you probably want to cook it maybe about three hours. But the great part about it is everything is in there and, and we are going to also have broccoli cauliflower and uh, red bell peppers with this and i'm going to go ahead and make a little bit of yeast bread so anyway all right it's boiling now and i'm going to go ahead and put it in the oven cut my burner off so we'll be back in about three hours to show you what it looks like all right we're back and we're ready to make our yeast bread for lunch now these are the ingredients that you'll need. Salt, King Author bread flour, and you'll need the yeast. Now this cup contains uh, one cup of water, one teaspoon of sugar, and about two teaspoons of yeast. Now this is not the rapid rise yeast. And what I've done is I've got my water to about 110 degrees or just barely warm to your hand dissolve the uh, yeast in that mixture and um, of course the yeast feed off of the uh, sugar. So I let that sit for about 10 minutes till it foams up. That way you know for sure the yeast are alive. You'll need a one cup measure and a little bit of canola oil and the key ingredient to all this is one heating pad just like you get in the uh, drugstore and people put on you know sore arms or sore legs or shoulders and I've got that on high and a little trivet to sit on top of it and you'll need a plain bowl that we're going to put about a tablespoon of oil in and this is where our bread will go when it's ready to rise all right and you'll need a bowl for mixing and this is the pan I'm going to cook it in all right we're going to get started, and I'm going to talk to you about the flour a little bit. All right, I'm going to position the camera so that you can see really well. All right, I think that'll do it. All right. First thing I'm going to do is put some flour in this bowl. And again, I want to emphasize the King Author flour. 
and it's bread flour. It has no preservatives and it's not bleached. So uh, it, it's the most expensive flour in the store and you can get it in Bilo, Walmart, and also Piggly Wiggly here in the South. And uh, I'm gonna need about two cups of this. Now, none of, none of these measurements are really exact, but you'll get the idea. Okay. So I'm gonna put two cups in my bowl. And by the way, you don't really need to sift this. And I'm gonna use about a teaspoon of salt. You can just pour it out in your hand. Now I'm going to put my yeast, water, and that little bit of sugar right down in the middle of this. Now if I need more flour, I'll just add more flour. I'm going to stir it up, and I'm going to be making a really stiff batter. Now I can already tell, see, that's going to need a little more water. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, we'll see. So I'm going to put just a touch of canola oil in, just a touch, maybe a tablespoon or so, not much. And I'm going to go ahead and put about a tablespoon in my glass bowl. Now I'm going to start mixing this up. Now, when you're making yeast bread, you can just mix it forever and knead it and it loves it because what you're doing is developing the gluten in the flour and that's what makes it stretch and that's what makes it have air bubbles because the yeast are going to start reproducing in the bread. Remember they're really like a little animal kind of and uh, that they will produce some alcohol. I mean that's what it smells like to me just if you take the cover off bread that you have let rise for an hour or so, it'll smell just like alcohol. But anyway, that's what causes the bubbles in the bread. Okay, because it turned out I didn't need any more water after all. So this looks about perfect. Now what I'm going to do is do some kneading. Now kneading, you know, they sh they'll show you in other videos and tell you about it. You're supposed to do it like this and, you know, press it down and all that. And you can do it like that if you want to. I just like to go ahead and pick it up because what you're doing is stretching this outside layer. Now we're going to need just a touch more flour because it's sticking to my hands just a little bit. So I'm going to put the flour down in there and just coat it a little bit. Just a little bit and start twisting it like this. Now just keep doing this and keep doing it until it starts looking like a, a really a little rubber ball is what it looks like to me. And you can see how it's stretching. See? So you just keep doing that. Dip it in your flour a little more. Now because this King Arthur bread flour has a lot of gluten in it, you really don't need to knead it as much as you would if you used some other kind of flour because it's already got a lot of gluten in it. And uh, I really like the fact that it's unbleached and it has no preservatives. Now see how I'm doing this? When I do like that, I'm getting air in there. Just keep doing it and I'm stretching it as I go. And see, that kind of looks like a rubber ball already. And really on regular flour, you would, you know, have to knead it, I don't know, probably about 10 minutes. But with this flour, you don't. Now see, it feels real soft, and it's not real, real sticky. Okay, now that's probably about enough. Probably fine. Let's just do a little bit more. All right, now on the bottom, I'm just going to take it and kind of try to seal it up. So I've got me a perfectly little soft ball here. Now I put a, about a tablespoon of the canola oil in this bowl. So what I'm going to do in order to coat the top, I'm going to turn this down and do it all around. That's going to coat the top. Still keep it in a ball. You don't want to flatten it out because you want those little yeast in there to make friends with each other and do whatever they do. Okay. 
So there it is. Now I'm going to cover this with saran wrap loosely. All right, and then we'll go back to my little secret on making good flour, good uh, bread. I'm going to put it on this heating pad. Now, the heating pad's already heated up and it's on high. And I'm just simply going to sit my bread, that my um, dough there. And I'm going to cover it loosely because it's going to, going to rise. And it'll take maybe an hour. Now, if you use uh, rapid rise be, uh, yeast, it won't take as long. But you really won't have as good a product if you just use the regular yeast. Now, you can get the, re re uh, the yeast in bulk from King Arthur. And uh, I think it, a pack of the, the uh, red yeast is what I use. Um, maybe will make about 90 loaves of bread. And when you figure in the cost and everything, that would work out to be about 10, maybe 15 cent for the yeast. And I don't know how much for the flour, but obviously you can make it a lot cheaper than you can buy it in the store. Now this bread is going to turn out similar to the kind of bread that they bake in Publix. So anyway, I'm going to cut the camera off now after it's um, sort of doubled in bulk. Then we're going to mash it down again and sort of shape it and put it in the pan, let it rise again. So I'll be back then as soon as this doubles in bulk. All right, we're back and our bread has doubled in bulk. See that? What we're gonna do is just punch it down. Then I'm gonna grease my pan. This is the pan that I'll be cooking it in. I'm gonna just put some Crisco in it, grease it real good, even up on the edges, because it'll probably come up a little bit. All right, now while my hands are still greasy, I'm going to take it out, kind of turn the bottom in. See how smooth that looks? I'm going to put it right down in my pan again, remove the old pan, put it right back on the hot pad, cover it up, and we'll let it rise again. Now it'll uh, probably rise in about, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes. Okay, so that's all there is to that. It's very simple. We're getting ready to prepare broccoli, cauliflower, and red bell peppers. Now, I wanted to tell you how to purchase your broccoli. This broccoli was purchased at the farmer's market January the 12th. The cauliflower was also purchased at the farmer's market on January 12th, but I didn't uh, prepare it for freezing until um, two days later. And we did keep it in the garage while we were waiting. Now this was the prettiest cauliflower I have ever purchased. And we got it at a super price, so you would need to buy cold weather crops when they're most abundant and broccoli and cauliflower are both cold weather crops so you would need to purchase those maybe in December, January, February and I go ahead and cook them completely and we don't particularly like the stalks so I'm going to show you how I fix this I'm going to just, it's, it's still frozen too by the way but it's somewhat thawed out so that I can break it apart break the little florets apart I'm just going to simply put that in the dish, then I'm going to put the broccoli in there. Again, just breaking the little florets apart and just, you know, make it look pretty. Okay. Now some of these are really big, so I'll cut them in two. Now to fix the broccoli, after we purchased it from the farmer's market, I did get a whole bushel. They come in boxes, but they're considered bushels because they do hold a bushel. I'm going to turn all my florets up so that I just want them to look pretty and sort of put them in together. Okay. Now, we also purchased 
some red bell peppers. Now, the bell peppers were uh, also inexpensive, and they were because they came from Mexico. So what I did was simply take the seed and the inner core out, core them, and uh, go ahead and just uh, freeze them. Now, we purchased these, see that? February 16th at the farmer's market. And there's what they look like. Now they're still frozen. And I want to show you how you can get the skins off of these very easily. They are, uh, they were very large peppers. So I'm just going to dip it in water. And remember it's still frozen somewhat. And you can just peel that peeling right off. I don't particularly like the peeling because I think they're hard to chew. So you can get it going like that. See, it comes right off. So I'm going to cut those a little bit. So I'm going to put these others out. So this would be the equivalent of um, one red bell pepper. Now you could use the yellow peppers or the orange pepper. So I just dipped it in the water. This is just barely warm water. Just catch your fingernail on it and it'll pull right off. Okay, I'm going to do this one now. See if I can do that without dipping in the water. Nope. Here it comes. See that peeling? Now these are a little more thawed out. If they're super hard frozen, it, it really is easier. There's that one. Now we've got one more. All right. Just peel that peeling right off. Catch your fingernail under it and pull it down. The, the, the pepper really needs to be frozen harder than these are frozen. There you go. I see. It's all off. We got one more to do a little bit on this one. If you can't get them off, of course, that's okay too, because that's just more fiber. Here's another little piece. And any problem like that one's got a little spot on it and just peels right off. Isn't that pretty? All right. And I do pack these in the freezer pack laying them so that the peeling, see that one came off really nice. Laying the peeling side together with the flesh side and that way when you take them out of the freezer they'll pop right apart. Okay, now uh, peppers are very high in potassium. So I'm just going to cut these and position them in with the broccoli and the cauliflower just to make it pretty. And I'd go ahead and make big, big hunks. It'll give the cauliflower and the broccoli a really good taste. And again, peppers are actually higher in potassium than bananas are. All right, now I'm going to just position those so that they look real pretty in the plate. Next, I'm going to sprinkle them with just a touch of garlic powder. Just a touch. You really won't know there's any garlic in there. But I'm going to sprinkle them with a little salt. Then I'm going to put little pats of butter, not much, just little bitty pieces on several of the broccoli and the cauliflower. And that's going to run down and coat most of them. Okay, that's probably enough. Now I'm going to cover this with saran wrap. Poke a little hole on the top of it. And when my other food is almost ready, because we're having the chuck roast with those vegetables, just poke a little hole right in the top of it. And they're still frozen, so this could sit here an hour, you know, waiting for the, the uh, other 
things for the meal to cook. So there it is. Cauliflower, broccoli, and red bell peppers. All right, we'll be back. Okay, the bread has doubled in bulk now. And we're going to go ahead and put that in the oven. 400 degrees for about 20 to 25 minutes. And we're back and lunch is ready. I've taken the chuck roast out of the oven. You see the dark on this top here? You don't have to worry about that because you can just soak it in the sink for 15 or 20 minutes and all that will come right off. The broccoli and cauliflower are ready, the uh, red bell peppers, and I've already taken my bread out and sliced it. Now, all we have to do is cut the chuck roast, and again, I'm going to use my scissors because it's going to be falling apart tender, so I'm not going to be able to cut it with a knife, so watch this now. Just go in there, stop the, stab the scissors in there, and cut it up. Now this um, chuck roast had some fat in it, so when we eat it, while it's on our plates, we'll just pick out the fat that we need. We'll probably be eating, I don't know, maybe three to five ounces of red meat, and that'll be it. All right, that's it, and we're just about ready to eat, as soon as this cools just a little bit. There's the broccoli and the cauliflower, and the um, red bell peppers. There's the chuck roast with potatoes and carrots. And there's the fresh bread. And there's the iced tea in our plates ready for food. Okay, I will see you next time. Bye-bye now.